If you were displaced from your home, put in a location you don't want to be in, you want to be back home, you've been through trauma, you've been pushed back, you've experienced violence from the state, you've experienced violence from individuals, you have trauma, PTSD, years of stress trying to prove yourself, constantly having to be aware and on edge. Why should you, when you get to your safe country, a safe country, somewhere you want to be, maybe somewhere you don't even want to be, why do you have to be nice in order to be deserving of a safe space? Mm -hmm. Why do you have to be the perfect migrant in order to be worthy of mm -hmm. this passport, this visa, this housing? A warm welcome, dear Davies, to the first English-speaking version of the Diary of Volunteers on Earth Hitchhiking Edition. <laughs> uh, I'm now already in Istanbul, the, in, in Turkey, uh, sitting here in the carpeted area of uh, the apartment of my couch surfing host who I'm staying with in Istanbul for five nights. And yeah, if you prefer to listening to podcasts in German, then um, make sure to check out the interview that I did last week already with Teresa. We talked about the same topic, the same organization that I will be talking about with Ash, my guest on this podcast, and that's the Medical Volunteers International, uh, an association that I had the pleasure and the privilege to stay with for, I think it was three nights in Thessaloniki in Greece. And Ash will tell you everything about the organization that you need to know. But before we get to the interview, just a little bit of housekeeping, because so much has happened since I left. Uh, I've been overwhelmed by all the, you know, responses and all the resonance that I got since starting this journey just over 10, 11, 12 days, I think it has been. So many people uh, started following on Instagram and I'm super happy. You can check out my daily updates in the stories and the posts there uh, at hitchhiking underscore dove. Yeah, if you are new to listening to these podcasts, I have recorded uh, deep dove episodes in English where I cover some of the topics that came up in the German interviews that I did for this podcast. So feel free to check those out as well. And... Yeah, in the meantime, I've also published a Patreon account. So if you really like the work that I do and if you think this is really cool and I would like to support you somehow, the best way is to do this through Patreon at the moment because I'm trying to keep this podcast as advertisement free as I can. So uh, Patreon is also hitchhiking underscore dove. And there you have uh, several tiers. It starts from four euros 50. Uh, you can buy me a döner kebab or some street food somewhere. But also if you're interested in uh, supporting me a little bit more, there's options for you as well. I won't be able to keep this podcast completely advertisement free. Uh, one of the sponsorships that I have is with the insurance that I chose to go with for this trip. Uh, it's called the Pro Trip Insurance by Dr. Walter, a German insurance company. And I am super happy. I feel super safe by all the coverage that they have. The plan that I am on includes an international health insurance and also um, an accident and liability insurance and assistance insurance. And I gotta be honest, I have had a little change of mind when it comes to insurances ever since uh, <laughs> the infamous bike incident that happened to me in China, where basically the insurance I had back then um, saved my ass. Um, so yeah, especially for adventurous trips like this, backpacking, volunteering, but also if you are an au pair or if you're doing some humanitarian aid work, I highly recommend uh, getting a good insurance and for sure, I feel like Dr. Varta is a great insurance to go with. So if you have not looked into this and if you're planning some kind of trip, make sure to go check them out. I will put the link into the show notes of this po podcast as well. And thank you so much for Dr. Varta for sponsoring uh, these podcasts on while I'm on the road. So with that being said, let's get into the interview. Unfortunately, 
uh, we didn't record a video because it was early in the morning and we were out on the balcony and there was no real way to set up a camera because the rooftop that you might know from Resi's interview uh, was occupied because MBI was holding uh, a first aid uh, course on the rooftop. So we recorded on the balcony and um, so you will have to do with the audio. I hopefully will be able to find a way to show this intro um, plus the audio for the podcast on YouTube. But please have some patience with me. <laughs> There's a lot of things going on. I'm constantly on the move, um, exploring and, uh, you know, trying to catch up with the these sort of podcasts, social media work and all of that. So just bear with me. And yeah, before I blabber on enjoy and here's ash from mbi yeah we're sitting on the balcony of the building the headquarters of mbi mbi the yeah the, the base of mbi in thessaloniki i yeah. guess i'm here with ash hello and if you guys can hear any sort of background noise it's because wednesday is market day uh, so there's going to be some yelling occasionally because the marketeers are marketing, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, but it looks really cool. I'll I'll show you guys some videos too. Yeah, and Ash was kind enough to do the English part of the podcast. I already recorded the, the German part with Teresa, and I think it turned out really well. Also, we got some really cool feedback already. People thought it was a really cool conversation, so I'm happy to do it with you now. Nice, thank you, yeah. Maybe just start with uh, introducing yourself, like who you are and why you're here. Yeah, cool. Um, so my name's Ash. I'm the field coordinator and logistics coordinator in Thessaloniki for MVI. Uh, my background is in migration studies, which is how I ended up here. And uh, yeah, I found out about MVI when I was working in Bosnia. Thought they were a really cool organization. And um, now I'm in Thessaloniki working for them so how long have you been here for now just a month I arrived beginning of February so we are exactly a month on Thursday okay and what are your impressions from that month I think this is was an interesting month to arrive uh, there's been a lot of changes we've had to close our main um, center of operations so I think yeah, just the chaos of it has been interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but MVI is, I think, still doing a great job here. Mm. I think we're still really needed. Um, I think it's difficult to have a first impression with a month that's been so chaotic. But we'll see how it goes in the next few months, I guess. Can you tell people what MBI is and what they do here in Thessaloniki and also in other places? Yeah, so MBI is a, an organization that provides medical care for people who have been displaced. It began as a mobile clinic, so we had a, a truck basically that went around providing medical care for people around Thessaloniki, around Athens. It's now spread to Bosnia, to Serbia. Um, and basically, our goal is to provide first aid for people who aren't able to access it anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And what does that look like? Like people come to you with whatever pain or whatever um, they have, and then you guys try and sort it out? Yeah, it looks different in every location. So in Athens, they have a clinic which they work from. For us, it's going to mostly be from now on working out of our vehicles by locations where people are stopping. Um, a lot of the injuries I think that we're going to be seeing now are going to be sort of movement related. So blisters, bruises, cuts, scrapes, we see dog bites. We try and provide basic first aid for everybody. And then anything more complex, sometimes we will try and help people get more or additional care. Mm -hmm. And anyone can, can come, you, but you don't like have any nope. sort of prerequisites Not or anything at all. like that? We treat anybody who comes and says that they need help. We have a few Greek residents who we've treated over the past few months. Mm -hmm. Anybody, if they've got residency here, if they have papers, if they have no papers, we don't ask for anything. Mm -hmm. They can just show up. Let me ask you about your background in immigration studies. How did that, how, how did that <laughs> uh, interest, maybe it's even a passion of yours, I don't know. I'm, sure somebody who works in that field 
has to be somewhat passionate about it too. Yeah, um, How did that come to be? It was completely, I, I've always said everything I've done, I've sort of fallen into and I felt like this was the first thing that I really... Oh, you too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it seems to be a, um, a lot of people here are yeah. in that situation. But um, no, so I, this is the first thing I feel like I've done where it was my choice and I began studying it and was like, okay, this is what I want to do. So I did my undergraduate degree in environmental studies and my thesis was on climate induced migration in Bangladesh. Climate, I'm sorry? Climate induced migration in Bangladesh. Okay. Climate induced migration. Okay, yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I started researching that and found that it was a whole world that I had no idea about and the politics of it and the impact that it was having on people's lives was just something I was so completely unaware of. Um, and I began, once I graduated, to do my own reading, my own research. I took two years out and COVID hit, so everything was kind of messy. Mm -hmm. And whilst I was doing that, I decided I really wanted to have a better understanding of the situation to learn more about what exactly was happening. And um, yeah, I applied to do my master's degree at SOAS in Migration and Diaspora Studies. Spent two years doing that. And I mean, I think it was in a great decision mm -hmm. for me, but I do think it's completely shifted my view on world politics. And it, I feel like it's something that once you step into, it's really hard to step out of because mm -hmm. it's a whole world that it's is... like eye-opening almost. Exactly, yeah, mm -hmm. but it feels like a, a, a world that is just not available or deliberately hidden from so many people because of mm -hmm. the atrocities that are happening on a daily basis. And it, once you begin to sort of realise that this is happening so close to home, I think it's very hard to then step back and say... I mean, it's also very difficult to continue <laughs> because it's, it's yeah, you're stuck in this sort of catch-22 of, I know this is happening, but how much can I really help? And I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. What were some of the, of your biggest learnings or some things that have shifted your understanding? Like, what learnings were there? A lot, <laughs> really a lot. Uh, <laughs> I went from being quite, I would say, fairly apolitical to very political. Mm -hmm. We've had a couple of conversations. Yep. Um, <laughs> I would say my politics shifted drastically. Yeah, Teresa used the word radically. She's, Sorry? She used the word radically. Her, she, her view shifted to be more radical. Is that the same case for you? Yes, yeah, definitely. I, I, I don't even know, because it feels like so much of what I I think to, to me feels like it shouldn't be radical. Mm -hmm. You know, I want people to be able to safely move and claim asylum in places. That doesn't feel radical to me. And yet when you have the conversations, it inspires so much emotion on both sides, both real racism, visceral anger and people who are really passionate about freedom of movement and who care so much. So I don't know. I think I've moved to a position that I think is labelled radical, but I don't always feel that what I'm saying is radical. Mm -hmm. But I guess, yeah. <laughs> but just also the, the awareness of how the political system like reproduces inequalities and is built upon the required oppression of I mean specifically the the reproduction of racialized capitalism and how that requires the suppression of people on the move people of color specifically like black and brown bodies and how border violence and border politics is so set up to reproduce this mm -hmm. and how the border is so inherent in our in the way that capitalism thrives mm -hmm. I think that was a surprise to me 
and okay. it's something that I've found to be very intertwined mm -hmm. in a way that was just unexpected. Yeah, that's very interesting because that's also something that I've also come to conclude for myself. You know that like there's so many systemic things, issues yeah. that yeah that enable the sort of widening of the gap even um, where the, the inequality is just becoming more and more as opposed to or at least it feels like that I don't know if, if, if you for sure know more about studies in that in that sense that should probably show that I don't know I, I again I think it's really I, I feel that you're correct I I think again it's difficult because for me you end up living in that bubble don't you where yeah. I think everybody thinks like this and I think maybe this is why I say oh I don't think I'm radical because I think everybody around me has these opinions and then you reach out and you're like oh wow okay yeah <laughs> that's not what everybody thinks and but I, I think yeah I think you're right there's definitely and actually yeah you can see in across Europe the the gap in class is widening and, and in the UK this is a huge issue that in quotation marks, unspoken class issue, which is actually widely spoken of unless yeah. you are middle class and you want to ignore it and you have the ability to ignore it. And you can definitely see like the class divide widening. I think, mm -hmm. yeah, I see it most in the UK, but across Europe and... So do you sometimes deliberately leave your bubble in order to also challenge yourself and also engage with people who may not have that sort of consciousness about what's really going on? I'd love to say yes. I'd really be like, I'd love to be the person that's like, yes, I go out there and search for other views. But it's exhausting because of people yeah. who have other views. I, I mean, genuinely believe that, uh, and on a day-to-day -day basis with their friends, I'm sure are perfectly lovely. But when you start talking about these politics, a, a really insensitive side comes out and I think when you've been here and working with people and seeing the violence that people face really every day the callousness with which it's discussed is really upsetting mm -hmm. and I I have had conversations with people and I have I, I grew up in quite a um, conservative area so when I go there definitely people the way people discuss these topics is with so such a lack of empathy and such a lack of understanding and knowledge and with you what horrifies me the most is you just hear the media rhetoric coming out of them and it's the same things that that you know Rishi Sunak is saying that Priti Patel was saying that Suella Bravman is saying and it's not true a lot of it and I think they believe it so wholeheartedly even while simultaneously telling you that they don't trust politics mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very paradoxical. I'm, I'm a actually. skeptic, yeah. but this is what they're saying. Yeah. So, yeah, and I, I, I think I've just found that it upsets me so much. Mm -hmm. And because I'm, they're talking about people I'm friends with, yeah, as if they're invading us, and it's just yeah. not the case, yeah. you know. What What do you think people should know that are in those conservative circles that are not necessarily in that bubble? What are some misconceptions, some maybe misunderstandings? Uh, or also narratives that are transported that are just that you have found to be completely untrue. untrue. I think the biggest one in the UK is we have this idea that people are people should only be punished if they're coming in through illegal migration routes. And the truth is, if you're coming to the UK to claim asylum, there is no illegal method to enter the country. Everybody has the right to claim asylum. Any way you enter, it, it shouldn't affect your asylum claim. You have the right to enter the country. It's not illegal. That's the biggest one, is how many people say, oh, those entering illegally should be... This is a huge discussion in Austria right, yeah. right now. Like, as yeah. we speak, this is the, the news headlines, basically, yeah. is illegal Immig uh, immigration. Yeah, and it's not, because they're mm -hmm. claiming asylum. And I mean, for me, for my politics, I, I don't care if you're claiming asylum or not. I think you should have freedom of movement. But yeah. that is a, a big sort of piece of inf misinformation that I hear a lot that people are at the the distinction between economic migrants and real asylum seekers mm -hmm. is this baffles me because mm -hmm. you know so much income and 
economic inequality is based on exploitation from the West and, you know, Western wars that have, you know, fought on land that isn't ours mm -hmm. and displacement caused by the actions of the West through climate, through, you know, food insustainability. Yeah. Or just poor g greed. Yeah, just pure <laughs> gre pure capitalist greed. And, uh, you know, our lifestyle is based a lot on the exploitation of... Uh, yeah, our lifestyle is based a lot on exploitation. Mm -hmm. And so when people... When I meet guys who are saying, well, okay, I wasn't persecuted, nobody was trying to kill me, but I had no life. I had no no prospect for the future. I had no, I never, I couldn't go out. I couldn't get an education. I, do you label them as an economic migrant? Mm. Or are they just trying to have a life? Just humans. Yeah. They're just, they're just trying to have similar experiences or some experiences yep. that people like us who are white skinned and are just lucky to be born into a place that they have. I have zero. It's not an achievement for me to be Austrian and to carry a powerful passport. Yeah. It's not an achievement at all. Yeah. And anybody should have that right. right to, you know, travel the world like I'm doing right now. And it feels so hypocritical almost to be sitting here when I'm on my way because I can't travel. Discussions like this. And so for me, Obviously, with Brexit, I can only be here for three months unless I get a contract, yeah. and it's something I'm trying to work around. And it feels so, it, it sits really weirdly in me with that I'm trying to stay here longer while so many people are trying to move through Europe. Yeah. And I, 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 How do you deal with that? I, I think about it every day, and <laughs> I, I, I don't, I, I think the fact that I want to stay in Europe and work in Europe and live in Europe isn't antithetical to people wanting to move through and I have mm -hmm. to I have to hold those two things separately in my mind that I believe people should move how be able to move how they want I don't think yeah I think people should move how they want so I think why should that not also apply to me sometimes mm. is, is difficult like I come from such a privileged passport but also it doesn't alter my politics yeah. or my beliefs. It doesn't, it's not, not adjacent to that, you know? I'm yeah. not. Yeah. Um. Okay, let me play devil's advocate a little bit because I like doing that. And um, also I, I have conservative friends as well, uh, or family, for example. And something that uh, I think, and I don't necessarily believe this to be a narrative that they are told, but some people are just genuinely worried about things. They are, for example, worried, oh, what if our values get substituted by other values by people that come into our country? Or even even t things like religion, or people are scared that they might lose their jobs. But I don't know. Whatever fear they have, it's always fear-driven, I feel like. Um, yeah, a lot of it. What, what do you, what can you say? Uh, what can you tell people that are fear-driven? There's nothing to be afraid of? Yeah, there's, I mean, <laughs> it sounds really simple, but there really isn't the the hegemony of of like Western beliefs and politics is so strong that people moving from one country to the other is just not going to impact that in the way that in the way that fear is sort of predicting that it will. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, maybe it's a good thing to have our beliefs shaken up a little bit. Yeah. The 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 jobs thing is ridiculous to me because part of like accepted migration is that those with good passports, good jobs. I mean, you have the difference between an expat and a migrant. Yeah. Ex for example. Yeah. <laughs> I was in an expat battle bubble when I was living in Beijing. Nobody yeah. called me a migrant there. Exactly. Yeah. You're an expat. I wasn't an economic you're... migrant. I made much better money than I would have ever as a teacher. So many of my teaching colleagues were just teaching abroad because they make much better money yeah. than when they're teaching in the UK, for example. So why is it okay if you're wealthy and white it makes no sense yeah yeah exactly so that would be my to the fear yeah you don't care if they're wealthy and white do you yeah so it's racially driven yeah it is yeah it must be and also well, um, okay I'll, I'll go deeper on the devil's advocating right <laughs> because i just love doing it so 
and this this for sure is media driven as well and as somebody who's spent two years working for a newspaper uh, I can at least tell some things from the inside you know yeah. how media logic works how attention logic works because obviously we, you are after um, attention uh, because our attention is limited and you have to grab that attention if you want to be successful as any sort of medium or whatever and for example when we write when something happens something really terrible happens somebody gets injured even maybe even gets murdered i don't know we write the name um not, not the name sorry the the origin of that person when they are not from austria yeah when they're from austria we don't write their austrian mm -hmm. we just write their uh, 26 year male whatever doesn't matter it's just an example but when they are from a different country we also write the country mm -hmm. And I ask myself, why? What is that trying to accomplish? Yeah, it's a simple like process of othering, isn't it? Yeah. They are not Austrian, they are other. And yeah. it's that fear of, that I think is so driven by national borders and the, the, the nation state mentality of, we are in our minds, you know, so this, my thesis was on the production of black British identity through music in the 1970s and 80s. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my research was about how nations construct themselves as these white pillars. And the, the and again, I say this in quotation marks, the migrant, the immigrant coming in is this other coming in threatening the whiteness of our nation mm -hmm. they are the the do you know do, what's the word i'm looking for the i'm not sure yeah no neither am <laughs> you're i doing, you're doing something with your fingers yeah. but i'm still not sure <laughs> but it, they're the threat that threatens uh -huh, our yeah. concept of what it means to be british which even like if the you kindle to light the fire in a way i don't yeah. know if that's what you're trying to say sort of yeah. in in a way that it disrupts our f completely false self-narrative of what it means to be austrian to be british to be dutch to be to be and i don't know if you want <laughs> book recommendations but gloria vecca writes on this very well about okay. about put them in the show notes yep say the name again gloria vecca okay about how nations construct uh, the false narrative that they are white and especially a nation with so much history of of colonialism as the uk the idea that we're a white nation is just absolutely ridiculous yeah and then it's the fear of this pervasion almost of this sense of whiteness that people then become so afraid of mm -hmm. and there's nothing to be afraid of yeah um yeah, yeah we are not a white nation some of my friends have <laughs> i hope they don't feel called out now <laughs> but we we have housing for people on the move obviously in austria and um sometimes well every male austrian interestingly enough has to do either civil service or military service after they finish um, secondary school. Mm -hmm. So some of my friends, they opted for civil service and they worked in those ho uh, housing units or whatever homes. I'm trying to dance around the world re word refugee homes, but that's what we call them in, in Austria anyways. And they have made experiences that they've told me firsthand experiences that a lot of them, a, a lot of people who are housed there, a lot of people on the move are very, difficult to handle let's say mm -hmm. to make it i don't know it's probably still not politically correct but anyways i think you're getting my point and they are and 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 i i think that also perpetuates the the narrative of fear because there are obviously we can't at least in my opinion we cannot completely ignore that there are some cultural differences they're not necessarily racial differences at all but there are cultural differences um, how do you how would you address that you're smiling yeah, <laughs> can, I, I'm expecting a great answer <laughs> please don't set your sights too high but I think there's a few I think I think there are a few points that can be reckoned with in what you said the first thing is the idea that people are, are difficult if you were displaced from your home put in a location you don't want to be in, you want to be back home, 
you've been through trauma, you've been pushed back, you've experienced violence from the state, you've experienced violence from individuals, you have trauma, PTSD, years of stress trying to prove yourself, constantly having to be aware and on edge. Why should you, when you get to your safe country, a safe country, somewhere you want to be, maybe somewhere you don't even want to be, why do you have to be nice in order to be deserving of a safe space? Mm -hmm. Why do you have to be the perfect migrant in order to be worthy of mm -hmm. this passport, this visa, this housing? Some people, and this is, this is a generalization to say that everybody has been through this trauma, this, this oppression, but a lot of people have. Yeah. Um, and again, I, I don't necessarily think it's helpful. I don't think I should be saying everybody has been through this because I don't think it's helpful to produce this narrative of you must have gone through this trauma in order to be to justify ba bad behavior, to just bad behavior, again in quotation marks, yeah. to justify not being perfectly civil and perfectly polite and so grateful for everything. I don't think you should have had to suffer t in order to to behave in a certain way. I think, you know, you're in a new country. I, I don't, we're providing people with the bare minimum, the basics. I, I don't think people need to be grateful for that. Mm -hmm. And that is something I see sometimes that frustrates me is this expectation of gratitude. Mm -hmm. When I don't think we're doing anything that people need to be grateful for, you know, mm -hmm. for us, we're providing them with medical care in a out of a car like in an environment you would never provide medical aid in in the uk it just mm -hmm. would be unacceptable but this is all they have access to why should they be grateful to us yeah you know it, and if if you expect gratitude i think that's not the i think something i say to the new volunteers here is you're here to volunteer if the volunteering and the work is not what you expect and that upsets you, it's okay to be surprised by that, mm -hmm. to be slightly uncomfortable, to be out of your depth, to be in a, in a space you're not aware of. But if you come here expecting excitement and drama and you don't get that and it's boring and routine, maybe you need to reevaluate why, you why you're doing it. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. So yeah, that was that's the I think. Yeah. Okay. We 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 dove, we dove. Dove. Yeah, I think deep. dove is correct. We dove yeah. deep. <laughs> yeah. We dove deep <laughs> into the politics now a little bit. Let's get back to the volunteering now yeah. because you mentioned it. Um, what are some things, or how do you prepare people that come here? How do you even start? If somebody's listening out there, for sure some German speakers will probably be interested, but may maybe also English speakers that are listening might be interested. How do you get started? How do you get involved if you really wanted to? And also, one more um, additional question. Sorry, it's a long question. What should you bring also to the table if you're wanting to do something like this? So I think the first thing to get started is read. It's, there is there is information out there. So I, I totally get that when you first start, it can be overwhelming and difficult to find the accurate and un, uh, unbiased information. I'm not sure any information is unbiased, but information that is is well researched comes from the field. And one of the, I think one of the benefits for me for studying this was just access to resources and learning about all the organizations that are there that are producing information so but yeah your podcast their bvmn border violence monitoring network produces monthly reports on borders across europe they're excellent um mit mobile information team do the same thing mm -hmm. there are organizations and if you're interested i can send them over and we can yeah i'll put them all in the show notes for sure amazing mm -hmm. but also read about the history of the location that you're intending to go to. I think that's really important and have an understanding of what the, the dynamics are in the area that you're going. And so I was in Bosnia last year and it's a really 
delicate political situation yep. with they have three different governments basically there's a history of being completely abandoned by Europe and left to deal with problems that once again Europe has caused in the Balkan region and so the situation is really delicate and going in there with no understanding of the history of Bosnia would have been I just think a bit naive yeah so yeah read about the history have an understanding and consider what you bring to the table mm -hmm. um, for MVI obviously there's a it we need people with medical training yeah so that's easy fine with other organizations I think yeah think about your skill set Think about it as almost a job. What knowledge do you bring? Are you good at logistics? Are you good at organizing? Are you, and honestly, this isn't the case for everybody because in cases where you're out here for two weeks doing short-term volunteering, I struggle with that in general. I. Okay. I don't know if this is a situation in which it is, unless there is a direct skill you are providing, like medical care, whether this is somewhere you can come for two weeks, dip in, help a little mm. bit, and then leave. I, I'm not saying it's not, but it is something that I grapple with, and I, I don't know whether to say, oh, it's better to do something than nothing. I'm not sure that's the case. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, I'm quite, privileged in the fact that I have had the opportunity to learn about this, to study this, and then now I have the ability to come here for three months and work. That's, that's not everybody is able to do that. And, but I think if you have a short amount of time, think about working with people. You want to help people on the move. You want to help people yeah. who have been displaced. There is so much in your home country that you can do. Yeah. And I spent, so I spent a year and a half working with women seeking asylum in London before I did any traveling yeah. to, to anywhere and I think actually having that base really helps understanding what people are facing in your home country before going anywhere else I think it it settles in your mind whether or not you are coming out here for the excitement and something new I think if you want to help people who have been displaced you need to know in your own mind that you want to help people who are displaced no matter where they are. Yeah. And if you're not willing to do that at home and you want to go somewhere else to do it, maybe you're not doing it for the reasons that you think you yeah. are. It's a really it's a really hard question and you have to and I'm I'm not saying I've done this completely. I I'm yeah. there are there is always going to be steps that we can take to to self-evaluate more and be really critical of your motivations. But I think you have to be very honest with yourself and be, do, do I, it could, because we all do, we all want the excitement, there's something different, something yeah. new. It's a philosophically tricky uh, really subject, hard. actually, if yeah. you think about it, or morally, ethically tricky, yeah. because of, and that's, I've, <laughs> I've, I think I've said it on the podcast too, probably, but, but I've said it to people, it's really hard to know if, what, whether or not what you're doing is something that dualistically spoken is going to be something good or it, if it's actually going to make situations worse sometimes yeah. it's not very obvious yeah. Um, yeah and that's when it makes it really hard so what I'm hearing from from you saying um, it's basically like volunteering tourism yeah. in a way in a sense yeah um, and again yeah, I, I don't blame anybody who wants to do anything good. It's great, you know, if you're trying to help. Um, yeah, but of course. it should and be for the right reasons. I'm not sure if I'm doing the things that I'm doing for the right reasons. No, neither am I. <laughs> I hope so, but... <laughs> yeah, but that's all we can do, right? Hope and, yeah. um, and try, yeah, and reflect and, you know, adapt if necessary. Yeah, so I think my uh, that was a very good summation of the very long-winded explanation that but I had. The question yeah. was very long too, so it was just fair that your answer was this long. <laughs> is there anything, I was just, while you were while you were answering, I was just thinking, is there any sort of platform that gives people an overview that you're aware of, of what opportunities there are in terms of helping people on the move, for example, where you can also, like, 
mix and match with your personal skill sets? Is there anything like that? I don't no, I don't think so. I, I think it depends on the country because I know in the UK we have a there's a list of organizations that help refugees okay. in the UK. So I'm sure there's an Austrian version of Probably. that. Probably, yeah. But oh, actually, there's a, an organization called Indigo Volunteers, okay. which you can go onto their website, you can put in how long you can volunteer for, what your skills are, mm -hmm. and they will try and find an organization to that you can volunteer with. So actually, yes. Show notes, Indigo Volunteers. Indigo okay. Volunteers. And that's mainly um, focusing on um, migration, people yes. on the move. Okay. Yeah, pretty okay. much entirely, I think. Okay, interesting. Okay. What else? Did I forget anything? Is there anything that you still want to mention or have on record? <laughs> I don't think so. I actually, no, that's a lot. I'm sure there's lots that, yeah. that still could be talked about. But I hope I've covered everything you wanted yeah. to hear. Oh, um, one, one, one question. What drives your motivation? I hate this question. <laughs> <laughs> because... You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so when I, I, as you know, I grew up in Hong Kong mm -hmm. and moved to the UK at the age of 10. And I was surrounded by the expat community. And I think for me, I, I, and since then I've lived in the US, I've lived in uh, around the world. I've been very, very privileged to be able to do that. And I think when I began to really understand the systems of migration and how it, the, the, the chasm of difference between my experience in moving and the majority of people's experience with it, it sat so wrongly with me. Mm -hmm. I, it, yeah, I, I, I just think for me, it's to have used and utilized that privilege to travel and to get an education and to, for such a long time, perceive myself as, well, an expat, but I mean, I've, I've never really perceived myself as an expat. I guess I, I grew up in one place and then moved to my parents' home. So, mm. but I, I think it's a juxtaposition between that, between my experience and then what I see happens on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, why should I have that privilege? I can't. I could never come up with. I mean, there isn't a reason yeah. why I should yeah. have that, and other people shouldn't. And then to just—that's the way. Honestly, I feel the same way. I guess in a sense if I understand you correctly, that it feels wrong to just sit on that privilege and just do nothing with it. Yeah. And, and you know, just have a good life and uh, enjoy and watch the rest of the world burn, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> For me to keep doing that and keep using that without trying to do any small thing that I can to rectify the, the difference it would feel, and I would like to keep traveling, so, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I just couldn't marry the two together. Mm -hmm. I couldn't continue to travel and see things and, and live my life in the way that I was, whilst knowing in the back of my head that this is what's happening. Yeah. For, from my experience, it also changes, it changed, it definitely changed something in me when you when you really start seeing how the circumstances of peop of how people live, how people move, that are not as privileged, like when for, for me it changed something when I when I like you know saw slums for the first time, for example. Also, again, as a tourist, which is not like not probably the best way of experience, but it is a way to experience it, and then that changes. It changed something in my thinking and in my seeing of the world. So yeah, I, I think I, 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 I understand your drive. <laughs> yeah, I, I, there is actually one thing I would like to say, because I sit here as a British citizen, a white British citizen, talking about my experience volunteering here. And I, a lot of the questions you've asked, very good, questions I've really enjoyed our conversation have been about 
how people perceive displaced people, refugees, people on the move. Um, we could have a whole conversation about the language used around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is a great platform for me to use my voice to speak for the people mm -hmm. is something that I, the people, um, I, I, I don't know how well I can speak for people is yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. I, I think I've said a lot. I'm sure that a lot of volunteers would disagree with me and I am in the number of voices who are there speaking out about it, there are so many people who are so excellent, who have experienced this, who are writing and speaking and have done podcasts and have written books. Go and listen to them. Yeah. You know, I, if, if you listen to this and, and it's interesting, white volunteers are probably the least interesting people to talk to is what I would Yeah, no, you're yeah. right. You're absolutely correct. I would totally support that statement as well. Um, find the people who have first-hand experience yeah. and listen to their stories yeah. um, because they are the only ones who can tell it. Um, the, they can, they're, they're the best at telling their own stories, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, I would totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll have to delete this later, but I'm really hoping Mohammed is going to write a book. He <laughs> I wants encouraged to. him yesterday. Yeah, he really should. I encouraged him yesterday um, to write a book about his experience. I'm going to be so annoying about this. I'm going to send you so many books and, <laughs> and papers and articles. And you don't have my email yet. <laughs> uh, but I know where Teresa lives. That's so. right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Let's wrap this up if you're okay with that. I have two questions at the end of every podcast mm -hmm. that I ask everybody. The first one is you have the opportunity to send a, a letter pigeon a letter dove mm -hmm. with a message. Yeah. It can be to one person, it, it can be to, to a person in the past. Um, it's a fictional dove <laughs> that's gonna fly okay. out. A magical w dove, yeah. Yes, what would be your message and to whom would you send it to? Oh, that's such a, such a difficult question. Um, I, I feel like everybody's going to say them, their past selves, don't they? No. <laughs> oh. Actually, pretty much nobody has said that so far. Well, or maybe one or two. But yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Well, how many people have you interviewed, <laughs> too? And it's nah, a few, a few. <laughs> Just, I, I, I would have to be my past self because I don't think anything I have to say is going to... I mean, maybe if a magical dove appeared on the desk of, you know, one of our former prime ministers, maybe yeah. they would pay attention to it. Yeah. But I, I can't imagine. I think the person it would impact the most is me yeah I think it would be to myself and I think it would just be a little more open-minded sometimes mm -hmm. and your ideas will change and that's fine like would just be yeah nice let your ideas change because I wish I'd been more open to that uh -huh. younger I think that's a great idea. <laughs> okay. <Thank you. laughs> and the second one is, what's your favorite bird? An albatross. An albatross? An albatross. Okay, yeah. why? I just think that I read a book when I was younger by Michael Morpurgo called The Albatross. Okay. And albatrosses are supposed to be quite, uh, I think there's like a, a superstition surrounding them, uh, that they're birds of death. Mm -hmm. um, but I, they're so beautiful and I, I just love them. Yeah, I love being on the sea. I grew up by the sea and it's always been, a, when you see albatrosses, they're always just wonderful. So, nice. yeah. Definitely nobody has said albatross so far. I thank can tell you, you that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ash, thank you so much. Oh, it was you. such a pleasure. Um, yeah, it's been, it's for been being interesting. On. Yeah, <laughs> great conversation. That was the interview with Ash. Thank you so much for listening. I realized this was probably much more political than the German version of this podcast with Resi, but I guess that is just normal if you are a migration studies expert like Ash is. And I hope that you really can take away some of the insights that she gave in this interview. I certainly did. I've certainly in those three days 
a lot in my thinking has changed about how I view migration and how I view, you know, um, movement dynamics. And yeah, stay tuned for more. There is going to be hopefully the next podcast. Actually, I won't tease too much because I don't know yet how this is going to work. But I am most likely going to go to the Hatay region in Turkey. Uh, which was devastated by the earthquake. As some of you might know, I have also talked about um, how to help, how to, uh, which organizations to donate money with. I know it's now maybe not on the top of your mind anymore, but I still think it is super important that we don't forget that there's still a lot of suffering. So maybe I can find a, a volunteering organization. Maybe I can find some scouts uh, that would like to talk to me on this podcast about their work in the um, regions that were devastated by the earthquake. Yeah, stay tuned and uh, check out some of the other videos and see you next time. Much love, peace.